Hello everyone, my name is Michael, and today we're going to continue taking a look at a ransomware. Uh, this is the second part in a small series on analyzing the stop DJ Vu ransomware. In the first part, we worked on uh, trying to unpack it, and so see that video on how I got this sample here. Now, I'm actually going to take a look in Ida here, and we saw some, some interesting strings when we were kind of scrolling through real quick. Um, first off, we have a string here with uh, it looks like almost like JSON for co country code. We have um, these look like some name servers and auto start flag. Uh, looks like an error message from get adapters info that might be interesting to look into. Um, a little further down there, I scrolled right past it. We have a string for Microsoft Internet Explorer. That's kind of random. Uh, we have some JSON ISK uh, strings for line and line two here. So let's take a look at what's going on with Microsoft Internet Explorer. Maybe is it going to like inject into it or something? Um, actually, no. It's going to open a handle to uh, access the internet. And we see that first parameter is actually the user agent. So it's going to try to pretend to be Microsoft Internet Explorer for some reason, but actually not correctly because it would uh, have a bunch of other garbage on the engine and the version and the Windows version and all that stuff after it. So kind of an amateur attempt there, I guess. Uh, if we continue taking a look down here, we have open a URL and we have HTTP query info. Um, what this is actually doing is it's getting some information from the request, uh, checking out like the return of what happened with this call and actually this hex 13 translates to 19 in decimal. So if we look at the documentation for the flags that could go to that, if we check 19, we have the query status, AKA the status code, um, query status code. So that'd be like whether it's 200 for okay, 404 for not found, etc. So they're probably gonna check, make sure, actually we do have a 300. Um, Okay, let's take a look at this uh, this kind of like JSON looking string here. If we look at the references to it, we are actually in a different function that uh, is read using Internet Read ha uh, File, which is uh, opening reading reading the contents from opening a string here. So actually, this might be uh, somewhere we want to break to see what it's opening. Um, this is how it's going to talk to a command server. Uh, if we actually start scrolling a little bit up here, it looks like uh, there's a dot bit string. Um, there's actually a question mark pid equals, so that's actually adding a parameter. So basically all of this other assembly here is like building a string dynamically or, a, or de obfuscating it or something. So we might want to break on that and see what it's calling. We'll actually see, um, it looks like it's probably going to parse a response with line one. And if we scroll a little further down here, we have a line two. Okay. So I'm gonna keep looking through here for anything interesting. Um, there is suddenly this giant block of hex being pushed into variables and then a call to a function. And this call is actually down here as well with a different variable. So um, I might break on that to see what this craziness is about. And let's go ahead and do that. So I've actually got my breakpoints set already for those two locations I mentioned. And let's go ahead and run the malware. Okay, so we got an error here. This actually we kind of pointed out at the uh, the last episode with uh, seeing that the malware actually runs itself um, since I don't have a .exe extension on it it failed to do so so we took a break here at the internet open URL and we can see the full address of what it's going to talk to so this is its server for command I guess so one thing of note here is we're passing a PID with a hex string here so 
I actually usually when I see like some type of a call out to a server or something like this, um, just I mean the, the name of the parameter kind of gives us a hint that this is maybe some type of an ID. Let's go ahead and actually rerun the malware and see if that is constant if it or if it's completely random each time. And it's actually the same. So what that means is there is something that this uh, malware is using to fingerprint this victim's computer, or in the case, my virtual machine, um, so that they can take it from there on gener matching up a key or something. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, let's go ahead and we'll see just all that stuff. Let's go ahead and continue to my next breakpoint which might actually take a little while because it, um, when it's not connected to the internet, um, it's going to try multiple times. Or if it failed to talk to the server for whatever reason, which um, actually was very common to be an error on their end. They had a problem with some proxies. Uh, they kept changing domain registrars or something. Um, I don't know. They had all kinds of infrastructure goofiness going on. So sometimes, even if the victim's machine was connected to the internet, it would still not talk to the server. And we'll see exactly what's going to do in that case. So I'm going to continue, I think, a few more times. I, I feel like it tries four times. And then, okay, we're at our weird uh, pumping a bunch of uh, words into a function here. Let's go ahead and step over it. And out pops a string. So this seems to be some type of a possibly a deobfuscation for this uh, this long string of characters here. If we take a look at that, I actually need to follow this. This is an address. We need to follow it to its final destination here as a ASCII string encoded as Unicode. Um, later on, they they strip out these zeros by turning it back into ASCII or something. So I would actually be interested where this um, where this string came from. Um, if we actually take a look here, let's take a look at this function real quick. Now there's a bunch of assembly here I wouldn't even bother looking at, but something that step, sticks out is this XOR by a hex 80. So I don't know. I like to just experiment sometimes. Let's take a look at. Uh, my tool crypto tester and let's just uh, let's grab one of these values oops that is not proper uh, let's copy that paste it in here let's do 80 as our key and hex XOR and because this is orange that means it's ASCII let's take a look at that we do have some ASCII characters here now this doesn't match up exactly what we see here as this string, but actually if we look further down, we have another we have another call to this same function here we're gonna take a look at. So we loaded something in here. Let's follow this. Okay, so we have this blob, which is actually actually that's uh, that's what they were pushing here to a variable. Let's go ahead and copy this whole thing. and paste it here and XOR it and we get all ASCII so okay interesting I wonder if this is going to be very similar to what pops out and it is now we actually do see um, because of the endianness uh, some of these are flipped so we have 6SE9 and six S E nine ending in C I R O or zero. Um, so actually, we have a uh, yep. Okay, we have two strings that are combined here in memory. So we've already figured out how to uh, deobfuscate part of their 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 strings here. Now, what's actually interesting about these two strings, um, if we take a look at this first half, I have a ransom note from another run of it. It's actually the victim's ID. So that actually matches up perfectly with the victim's ID. So actually, this we're going to follow later in another video, but you might be able to guess what, 
what this is. So let's take a look at the a different scenario. So this malware has a key and ID that are going to be used if it can't talk to the server. In another video, we'll analyze the actual crypto and how it uses that um, as the victim's kind of master key. Um, but let's go ahead and see what happens when it does talk to a server. So I'm going to reconnect my network adapter. And let's relaunch it. Get to the entry point. Going to do a lot of things here. And it's going to fail to run itself because it doesn't have an exe extension. OK, so now we are going to actually call this server. And it will succeed now. So we haven't reached this part of the code before. So we're going to read the contents of what was given to us. And let's see what it ends up parsing out. So we get to this part. We're looking for this line one. And here's a response from the server. Let's take a look at EAX. And the server returned to us this, uh, this string here. So what this actually ends up being is the server is returning our ID and uh, what's going to be a key later on. Um, so that is something that's interesting to keep in mind. Now, another thing that is also worth looking into is whether the server is going to return the same thing each time. So let's go ahead and refresh, get to the entry point. It's going to run, it's going to fail. We're going to call the server again. Skip through some things here. And yep, that is the same string. And actually, if we look at it in a browser, Go, I actually have the uh, the URL kind of prepped here. No matter how many times we refresh, it's returning the same key. So it is doing something with this ID. And I, I mean, I don't know the infrastructure on their end either. They might be generating something random and then just storing it. And then each and then each time that this same string is, is uh, requested, it pulls it out of the database. Or maybe it's used as a seed for something. I don't know. Um, this actually is not uh, talking to their server right now. I have a fake server that is redirected to my uh, virtual machine. So if we do this, we're actually hitting my host. <laughs> so I just made kind of a mock server to show what they're doing. But if we modify, this is, this is similar to what they did on their end if we if we modify this with like some other numbers or something um i could feed it just garbage and it'll give something else but it's going to be the same thing so this is a way in the past that i used to kind of steal keys um, from their server um however they did make changes we'll talk to that and about that in a whole other video with all the changes they did with a newer version that uh, circumvents my ability to do that. Um, one last thing that I would be curious of is that PID, that ID that it's sending to the server. Um, this took a little bit of digging the first time, but I'm going to go ahead and kind of take a shortcut here. Um, if we take a look at the imports, this is just part of my normal thought process is looking for the, the crypto. Um, so since I see the crypto API here, we do have a call to create hash. So let's take a look at, well, it actually calls it several times here. And the algorithm 8003 is actually MD5. So it's taking an MD5 hash of something, but we don't have a crypt encrypt function. So that's why we're gonna have to dig a lot deeper to look into the crypto in a further in a future video. Um, there was a mention in the strings here 
let's see, it was up here, about getting an adapter info. Hmm. Let's take a look into that. You're allocating for get adapter. Yep, we have a get adapter info. And we actually have some something with uh, this almost looks like printf formatting. So we're getting an address here or something. So I'm actually curious what is being what is being hashed here. Now we can take a look at the crypt hash data function. There's actually going to be a few calls of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break on that. Let's break at um, 404af8. And let's break at the other one. Now I could do like in the previous video where I uh, break at just this function and then jump into user land. But the problem with that is this actually hashes this data. So I have to see it before it calls the function. Um, let's break at 404d1e. 404d1e. Uh, and I believe there was another call at 406824. <clears throat> All right, let's see what it is hashing. We get our first uh, first hit here. We are actually. I need to restart the malware. It might have. It might have actually ran some hashing before. Uh, before we talked to the server. There we go. We just broke at the first crypt hash data, and we see this actually follows that format that it was looking for in the get adapter info. Um, and if uh. If, if you know a little bit of networking, this actually looks like a MAC address. So let's uh, get MAC. And yep, 08002785A7A33. So it is actually getting my MAC address. It is going to hash it. Um, it's going to hash it with MD5. And later on, they do a bit of uh, they do a bit of processing on it. They uh, change it to uppercase. They change it to hex. We just saw a 39 up here. We just saw a 48 up here. 38, 48, or 39, 48. So this is actually, and we can verify by it being 32 characters, which is actually 16 bytes, this is an MD5 hash. So that's how they are identifying the victim machine is basically an MD5 hash of their MAC address. So that's some things to definitely keep in mind um, when we, uh, we kind of take a further look into the crypto. Um, but that's a very interesting thing to note. So that will conclude the second part of this series, uh, mini series on analyzing the stop DJ Vu ransomware. Um, in the future ones, we still need to look at the crypto scheme, um, how it handles files, uh, the file mark, talk about the file marker and such. Um, so, and then also some changes they've done. So there's a couple versions of this ransomware. Um, so, uh, thank you for watching and uh, stay tuned for the next installment. Thank you.